vážení mě návštěvníci, děkujeme vám, že jste přišli na premiéru nového přednáškového cyklu Skeptical Tuesdays. Mé jméno je Klet Mimberg a jsem členka klubu Sisyvos a zároveň předsedkyně Evropské rezidentských organizací. A než se přijde do angličtiny a než přijde k hlavnímu programu večera, dovolte mi, abych vám představila přednášku. Sisyvos ročně pořádá více než 60 přednášek se stupem zdarma a drtivá z nich je potom k dispozici ke zhlednutí na YouTube. Mimo to pořádá každoročně pěknou malou skeptickou konferenci Skeptikon, pokaždé na jiném místě v České republice, ale to se k nám můžete přidat v příboře na Moravě, což je rodné město v Projde. Také pořádáme přidávková neumovatiky a českou odnož akce 1023, která bude mít letos 10. výročí a prosím sledujte náš web, je tomu bohatý program. Mimo to vedeme i projekt Paranormální výzvu, která je česká podoba The Paranormal Challenge, kterou původně založil v roce 1926 Fulíny. A teď česká výzva nabízí zatím tu největší odměnu na světě a jsme moc rádi, že držíme tento prim. Abychom mohli tyto aktivity provozovat, tak potřebujeme naši podporu, ta potřebujeme podporu od našich členů a od našich příznivců. Takže pokud nás máte zájem podpořit, prosím, můžete nás můžete podpořit přes takto čvátečníku, anebo si můžete podívat na náš web, kde jsou informace, jak na to. Děkujeme. Dear guests, thank you for coming to our debut of our new lecture cycle, Skeptical Tuesdays. My name is Claire Knieberg, and I'm a member of the Czech Skeptics Club and the president of the European Council of Skeptical Organizations. The Czech Skeptics Club holds over 60 free entry talks a year, and we also organize a conference for the public every May, uh, and the Czech leg of the homeopathic overdose, which, by the way, this year will be the 10th anniversary of, so make sure you go in your home country to visit it. Uh, we also have the Czech Paranormal uh, Challenge, which offers currently the highest prize in the world. To do all this, we rely on the generosity of our supporters and our members. So if you wish to support us, please check out our website where there is information on how to do so. Thank you. Allow me to introduce our fourth foreign speaker. For our Slovak speakers will hopefully forgive me for not including them. And the first speaker in this all new and all English lecture cycle, Professor Emeritus Edward Ernst. Professor Ernst qualified as a physician in Germany where he also completed his MD and PhD thesis. He was professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Hanover Medical School and head of the PMR department at the University of Vienna. He came to the University of Exeter in 1993 to establish the first chair in complementary medicine. Since 2012, he is Emeritus Professor at the University of Exeter and now lives in Cambridge. He uh, is and was the founder and editor-in-chief of three medical journals focused on alternative and complementary therapies, European Journal of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and Perfusion. His work has been awarded with 17 scientific awards, most recently the John Maddox Prize and the Oakham Award, and uh, two visiting professorships in Canada and the USA. He served on medicines commissions of the British Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency between the years 94 and 2005, in 1999, he took British nationality. He has published over 1,000 papers in peer-reviewed medical literature, 51 books translated into over a dozen languages, including the recent one, More Harm Than Good, The Moral Maze of Complementary and Alternative Medicine. He has written over 100 book chapters and has spoken in over 700 lectures worldwide and supervised over 50 medical uh, MD and PhD theses. So please, uh, Give a warm welcome to our professor, Edward Ernst. Hello, good evening. Thank you so much for this kind introduction. Thank you for uh, inviting me to your beautiful town. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, so-called alternative uh, medicine and I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background. You've noticed on, on the title that I now tend to call it so-called alternative medicine. Why do I do that? Why not just alternative medicine like everybody else? Uh, there are exactly three reasons for that. Firstly, if a therapy doesn't work, it cannot possibly be an alternative. Secondly, if a therapy does work, it's not alternative, but medicine. And thirdly, I've published a book 
which is called SCAM, uh, so-called alternative medicine. So three good reasons. Um, by way of further background, I don't need to tell you all this because Claire just told you most of it. Um, maybe I should point out that I started my medical professional life as a homeopath. Uh, when, when I graduated from uh, Munich Medical School, I got a job as a junior doctor in, a, in the, the, the only homeopathic hospital in Germany at the time. And this is where I learned uh, homeopathy, but also many other um, alternative treatments. And this is where my relationship to this field started. Later on, I became a scientist, a regular clinician, but in the back of my mind were all these unanswered questions uh, about alternative medicine. And in 1993, in the New Scientist, there was a little advertisement. The University of Exeter was looking f uh, to open the first chair in the world in uh, complementary medicine, uh, as they called it. And I applied and I, I, I got that post. And uh, yeah, I, I saw Exeter after Vienna, which was very turbulent for other reasons. After, after Vienna, I would lead a very quiet life and do a little bit of research in alternative medicine, but it was even more turbulent than, than Vienna. Um, 1990, no, no, uh, 2011, 2012, I retired, and nowadays I give lectures like this evening. I write books, I, I, I also write a blog, which you're welcome to visit. So that's enough about me. A little bit about uh, SCAM, so-called alternative medicine. How do we define it? It's an umbrella term for diverse range of therapeutic and diagnostic. We often forget that, uh, that it's also diagnostic. Man many of the techniques, if you think of tongue diagnosis, pulse diagnosis of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, therapeutic and diagnostic modalities which have little in common other than being outside mainstream medicine. And it really goes from A to Z, from acupuncture to zone th therapy. Somebody counted uh, uh, four, 400 different modalities under this vast umbrella. A little bit more background. Um, globally, we spend a lot of money. Currently, it's estimated to be $80 billion on alternative medicine. Most of this money comes out of uh, the pocket of the patients. It's not usually covered by health insurance or national health services. The press has a very keen interest in, in the subject, at least that's the case in the UK, uh, probably also. Uh, in, in the Czech Republic. There are powerful lo lobby groups. Uh, we'll come to that a little bit later. Uh, consumers are bombarded with fake news. Uh, there are about 50 million websites uh, on, on alternative medicine. And 99.99999% of these are totally rubbish. Uh, they try to sell you things, they try to mislead you things uh, in, in, into, into doing wrong decisions, etc., etc. Interestingly, doctors in, in most countries are, are completely bypassed by, by, by this. Uh, alternative medicine is in the hand of non-doctors in many countries. I'm not sure about the Czech Republic. And they often have little interest at all. They just smile at it and think, uh, well... Uh, nothing. Um, many consumers have a quasi-religious belief in, in the subject and this makes discussions often difficult and there are plenty of fallacies which are the subject of my talk today. The Czech Republic, uh, in preparation for today, I did some research and I found this uh, 
uh, article in Complementary Medicine Research. Um, and it reports a, a, a survey, actually two surveys, uh, uh, two, 2011 and 2014, repeated the same surveys on a random sample of the Czech uh, uh, population, quite a large sample, so the, the results should be reliable. And they show that in uh, 2011, it was 76% and three years later, 87% used at least one form of so-called alternative medicine in the last 30 days. That is absolutely staggering. Uh, you are the world record uh, holders in uh, usage of alternative medicine. That's if the results are clear and uh, uh, true, and I have no reason to doubt them, uh, th this is far more than any other, other country than, that I'm, I know of, perhaps uh, with the exception of, of China. <clears throat> and here in, in, the, in the Czech Republic, the, the most common forms of scam were vitamins, minerals, which arguably are not actually scam, um, herbal teas, massage, and relaxation techniques. So, uh, let's approach the subject of my talk. I'm, I'm talking about fallacies. What are fallacies? Um, they are misleading arguments, uh, misconception falsehoods, and the opposite of facts and reality. And if you, if you read about alternative medicine, you soon find that the subject is burdened with a lot of fallacies. And I'm going through a, f a few of them. I, I, could, I could go on forever, but I, I have had to restrict myself to eight different fallacies. And uh, I present them in, in blue background slides so that you, you know where we are. The first fallacy is appeal to authority. And that goes something like this. Many very important people, even Nobel Prize winners, uh, like alternative medicine, therefore it must be good. And if it's good, uh, it's only just that everybody should have it, preferably paid by the state. So that, that is the, the fallacy and here we have some, some, some people to, to support this, very important people. And I brought four books. You can, you can win four books uh, during this talk today. That should keep you awake, maybe. Uh, whenever you, you see this, this little explosion on my slides, there's a book to win. Uh, and the first person who shouts the name of this guy gets the book. Hmm? Linus. I don't know the first name. Mr. Linus, is it? I haven't sure. uh, Yeah. It's li li Linus uh, uh, Pauling. Uh, yeah, that's good enough. That's good enough. One, <laughs> one, one, one book is gone. He, he, uh, he was the, f the father of also, also uh, molecular medicine. He promoted extreme high doses of vitamin C uh, and claimed that it prevents all sorts of diseases um, and, yeah, uh, even cancer. And he died of cancer. Um, but th this one is uh, Dr. Alls, who has a show in the United States promoting all sorts of rubbish. This is the fastest man on, on earth who promotes um, Homeopathy. This, of course, is my friend Prince Charles. <laughs> this is Olivia Newton John, who presently is fighting cancer, uh, amongst other things, with uh, uh, um, will come back to me straight away. Uh, th this one everybody knows. Uh, th this one even even more famous. She is presently promoting all sorts of rubbish. Um, 
uh, and this one is a Nobel Prize winner, Luc Montagnier, who uh, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the AIDS virus, but now has discovered that extreme high dilutions have effects and therefore is, um, is uh, the darling of the world of homeopathy. So one book is gone. And the facts, the, f the facts which I contrast to the fallacies are, uh, come always in with yellow background. The fact is that even very important people like the ones I've showed you make very important mistakes. That, that, that is obvious to anybody who has a, a, a little bit of critical thinking, yet the, f the, the, f the, f the appeal to authority fallacy continues and is very popular in, in this field. Next one, appeal to tradition. The argument goes something like this. Um, So-called alternative medicine has survived hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, it wouldn't have survived it if it was useless. It has been field tested in, on millions of people. Uh, and, and this field test uh, weighs much more than any modern scientific test, which typically is on just a few dozen of people. And therefore, uh, this proves that so-called alternative medicine is both effective and safe. Here we have another book to win. Who's this guy? This lady, by the way, is not doing what you think she's doing. She, uh, she's steaming her vagina, uh, which is presently being promoted by Gwyneth Paltrow, which we, sh we saw on, on, the, on the other slide. Um, um, th this is Hahnemann who invented homeopathy, and the other things are pretty clear. But who is this one? Corsaco. No. <laughs> Don't let me take my books home. <laughs> Uh, it's D.D. Palmer, uh, who invented, uh, about 120 years ago, chiropractic. Um, he, he had a janitor in, in, in the building where he worked. The janitor uh, uh, was deaf, and he manipulated the upper spine of the janitor, and the janitor could hear again. Um, and that was the, 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 the hour of the birth of chiropractic. Never mind that the, the nerves that supply the ear don't go through the spine, the cranial nerves. But uh, th that little detail has not st stopped any chiropractor yet. Okay. The fact is, is pretty obvious. Uh, if a scum has a long history, it also indicates that it comes from a time when we understood fairly little, if not anything at all, uh, about how the, the, the body functions. And therefore, a long history might even be a negative feature. So the, the uh, appeal to authority is pretty ridiculous. Special pleading, uh, another fallacy. And the argument goes that uh, so-called alternative medicine is so unique that it cannot be squeezed into the straitjacket of science. Science is uh, reductionist and uh, alternative medicine is holistic and, and therefore this doesn't, doesn't work. I, when I started in, in Exeter, this was the argument that I heard most, most often. And it's a, it's a fallacy. Um, because the straitjacket, what they mean by the straitjacket is the clinical trial. Um, there, there is no uh, alternative treatment that I know of that cannot be tested in a clinical trial. And a clinical trial works roughly like this. You have a group of patients or volunteers like us here, and you divide them, preferably at random, into two groups, A and B. Group A receives the treatment that you want to test, the alternative treatment, anything from chiropractic to faith healing, and B receives something else, preferably, if possible, a placebo, not always possible. 
Then this runs its course, and at the end you compare whatever the claim was. If it was headache, uh, you compare the intensity of the headache. If it was a uh, number of hair on your head, then you compare that. So it's very, very simple. And, and the, the assumption that alternative medicine cannot be tested in this way is just simply not true. In fact, the very first test in the history of, of, of medicine, the, 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 the very first controlled clinical trial was a trial of alternative medicine. The year was 1747. Uh, primary investigator James Lind. The condition was scurvy. Scurvy was killing more sailors at the time than sailors were killed in battle. Um, and this guy, here he is, James Lind, was, was the, 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 the chief officer of, of the British Navy and he decided to test a few remedies which were fashionable at, at, at the time and, and assumed to um, cure scurvy. So he allocated two sailors each to all sorts of different groups. At the time, he thought that scurvy could be cured with acid. And therefore, as a sort of afterthought, he, he uh, included oranges and lemon. And the results were so clear cut that even this tiny sample size of two sailors in each group produced a very clear result. Th these, these sailors survived and the other ones died. Uh, pretty clear. Um, he had no idea at the time that this has anything to do at all with vit vitamin C. Vitamin C uh, was a non-entity. Nobody knew about it. Actually, he thought this was a confirmation of the theory that acid would uh, cure scurvy. He interpreted his results in that way, and, and, and because of this misunderstanding, it wasn't implemented uh, immediately. And it, it took uh, more than a decade until this was properly imp implicated and saved uh, thousands, tens of thousands of, of sailors' lives. And another very interesting historical fact, the first ever randomized controlled clinical trial, double-blind controlled clinical trial in the history of medicine is a homeopathic trial. Uh, the, the, the British scientists pride themselves that this was, th th that this happened in uh, uh, 1948, I think it was, uh, but in fact it, it happened much, much before. It happened in 1835. And this was a group of people in Nuremberg, um, and they called themselves Gesellschaft Wahrheitsliebender Männer. This is a society of truth-loving men, which is very amusing because in Nuremberg, as we all know, women are not truth-loving. Um, and they decided to, to test uh, the theory of Hahnemann. Uh, th they uh, produced placebos and, and uh, a homeopathic remedy and tested that and found out that the results were indistinguishable from placebo. So not only the, the first clinical trial, randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial in the history of medicine, but also the first negative result for homeopathy. So the fact is that science can certainly not answer every question. If I want to find out whether my wife still loves me, I can't do a randomized clinical trial. Um, but if I want to find out whether therapy X has uh, an outcome Y, then I certainly can do a clinical trial. Next fallacy, uh, scam is effective. That is probably the biggest fallacy of them all. And this is believed by obviously providers of so-called alternative medicine and by all the many, many users of alternative medicine. And I told you we have 400 different modalities. 
so I had to choose one. I chose um, homeopathy because uh, it, it, everybody s seems to have an opinion about homeopathy and I have some personal experience about it. So this is Hahnemann, Samuel Hahnemann, who uh, more than 200 years ago invented homeopathy in Germany. Uh, this is a German post postal stamp and on the stamp he's called Helfer der Menschheit, Helper of Mankind. And strangely enough, you, you, you wouldn't believe it, but he was a helper of, of mankind because he invented homeopathy, which was uh, virtually harmless and, and saved clearly thousands, if not uh, hundreds of thousands of people from the dreadful medicine that uh, we nowadays uh, call heroic medicine, which uh, the, the medicine of, of the time of Hahnemann, which killed more people than, uh, than the disease killed, it was more dangerous than the disease, bloodletting, mercury, that sort of thing. And Hahnemann uh, came about uh, his leading principle, like cures like, um, he, th this is how he expressed it, every medicine which produces most of the symptoms present in a given disease is capable of curing that disease. That's the like cures like principle. It sounds complicated, but it couldn't be simpler. If you cut an onion, in all likelihood your eyes start watering. Uh, for homeopaths, like myself, this means I can cure any condition that goes with watery eyes with onions. That's the like cures like principle. That, that's not, not, not even a theoretical example, it's a true example. And of course I wouldn't use pure onion, uh, that would not be tolerable. Uh, homeopaths dilute the onion or what, whatever else they take um, in, in, in different dilutions. This depicts a dilution of 1 to 100. So one part of, of onion juice in 99 parts of solution, uh, alcohol and water. Then they take one part out of this and do the same dilution again, and the same dilution again, and the same dilution again. So very quickly, uh, this, uh, this goes down to zero, and, and um, the, the little trick that is important for homeopaths, they, they shake uh, at each dilution step, they shake the, the bottle or what, whatever they use for diluting, and by, by this shaking, they assume that some energy is being transferred. Not just transferred, but potentized. They, they call this process potentiation. Uh, so in their mind, uh, this remedy gets stronger and stronger and stronger. The most, uh, I come to, come to that uh, in, in a second. What, what, you see, what you see here is the, the concentration of the onion or whatever is in the remedy. You, you can see that it goes down to zero almost instantly, but uh, a C4 he, here, which, which almost no more onion in it, is still a very undiluted uh, remedy for homeopaths. They dilute endlessly. The, the typical one that, that they use, and which Hahnemann favored, was a C30, that is, 30 times diluted, 1 to 100. And, and this is a, a dilution of 1 to, I don't know how many trillion, uh, or I, I, I don't think there's a word for it. Uh, it's less than one molecule per universe, a C30. And, and the, the, most, the, the best selling remedy worldwide in, in homeopathy is one called Oscillococcum, uh, and that is produced from a duck's liver and a duck's heart, and that is a C200. 
that, that uh, is uh, less than one molecule in probably all the universes uh, together. Yet homeopaths know that their remedies work. They know homeopathy works and, and they have evidence for that. This is one of their preferred studies which was conducted in Bristol, not far from Exeter, where I worked. It was an observation study on just under 7,000 patients uh, suffering from a range of chronic conditions. They were treated with homeopathy and 71% reported positive health effects. This 71 figure, or around 70 figure, is a figure that pops up all the time, and that should make you very suspicious. The conclusion here as a quote, homeopathic treatment is a valu valuable intervention. That's very clear. Unless you know that there was no control group to compare it to, that uh, the uh, patients also got all sorts of uh, conventional treatments in, in addition, and that therefore the explanation could be a placebo effect, the natural history of the disease, a regression towards the mean, etc., etc. So, most likely, the uh, uh, positive results in 71 patients has nothing to do with the homeopathic remedy at all. This is a trial we have conducted. A randomized clinical trial, double blind, placebo controlled, uh, in just under 200 children suffering from asthma. We chose children because uh, homeopaths claim children respond better than adults. We chose asthma because asthma certainly is a condition that homeopaths believe they can cure. They were treated with individualized homeopathy. Uh, homeopaths insist that the, their treatment needs to be individualized, uh, meaning uh, each patient might need a different remedy uh, uh, against um, placebo. Uh, main clinical endpoint was quality of life, and the result was no effect of quality of life uh, or any other endpoint that we measured. And our conclusion, no evidence that adjunctive homeopathic remedies are superior to placebo. Now, you, you could say that this is a very cherry-picked result and that I have an ax to grind against homeopathy, etc., etc. Um, and in a way, you would be right. One can never judge one therapy on one single trial. Today we have, would you believe, 500 clinical trials of homeopathy. And there's a great temptation to cherry pick. Homeopaths are great at, at, at cherry picking. They, they uh, show you the results that happen to be positive uh, and try to convince you that homeopathy does work after all. Uh, but cherry picking is, is a, a different word for, for cheating. It is dishonest, it's uh, not scientific, it's, it is just misleading. We need to evaluate the totality of the reliable evidence, and that is called a systematic review. Um, and in homeopathy we have plenty of systematic reviews, so one day I decided to do a systematic review of systematic reviews, uh, which is a little bit unusual. But anyway, I, I did it, published it in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. That's uh, a long time ago. And the conclusion was clinical evidence for homeopathy does not warrant positive recommendations for its use in clinical practice. That's a polite way of saying it's rubbish. Um, and that, that was two, 2002, um, and in 2015, uh, the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council repeated that, more or less, uh, but much, much better. The, uh, at the time, they, they found 
many more systematic reviews. They included 53. Uh, today, I, th I think there, there are probably around 70 systematic reviews. Anyway, they, they, they did this uh, uh, very rigorously and concluded that the evidence does not show that homeopathy is effective. You can't say it any clearer than that. The fact is that, like so many other scams, homeopathy lacks proof of effectiveness. Next fallacy. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. This is about cause, effect, chicken and egg uh, problematic. And the argument is, if you, if you talk to, to somebody who is a fan of this or that scam, I know it works, I don't need scientists to, to tell me it doesn't work, I'm not stupid, I know it works. So, let's look at this a little bit in detail. Schematically, what, what, ha what happens if, if a patient goes to see a clinician, he or she has symptoms, that's why she goes. Let's say pain. She is in pain. So that's why she goes to a clinician. The clinician prescribes a treatment and with a bit of luck, uh, the symptoms uh, get better. And the difference between the initial and the eventual intensity of the symptoms is what I call the perceived therapeutic effect. The perceived therapeutic effect is something that we as medics equate with the specific therapeutic effect of what we have done or prescribed. Uh, th that happens not, uh, not only in alternative medicine, in any type of medicine. Uh, uh, doctors are hardwired to do that. They're probably needed for survival um, to, to, to think that their treatment so to speak, did the trick. But there are lots of other things happening here. There's the natural history of the disease. A, a common cold takes uh, 10 days if I treat it and one and a half weeks if I don't treat it. That's the natural history of the disease. And it, it is virtually indistinguishable from the uh, therapeutic effect. Then we have the regression to the mean. That's a statistical phenomenon. Uh, values that are outliers, if you measure them again, are likely to be closer to the mean. Then we have a Hawthorne effect. That, that uh, is an effect uh, describing the phenomenon. If I observe a patient, that will induce certain uh, reactions. Uh, in that case, it will uh, uh, masquerade as uh, getting better. The patient improves just by being observed. Then we have all sorts of concomitant treatment. You, you have seen in the homeopathic observation study that I've shown you that patients, of course, took all sorts of other treatments as well. And that, uh, if, 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 you, if you don't uh, allow for that, looks as though uh, there was an effective treatment. Then we have the placebo effect, uh, much talked about, uh, probably not as imp imp important as, as the other, uh, or some of the other effects. Uh, and then you have social desirability, that's a pompous word for, for a very simple fact. Um, if I'm kind to my patient, and uh, homeopaths are very often very kind, empathetic physicians, then the patient is kind back to me. In other words, I ask my patient, do you feel any better? The patient feels dreadful, but doesn't want to upset me and says, yes, of course, doctor. So the truth is that ineffective and even slightly harmful treatments can be followed by positive outcomes. That, I think, is quite important. Next fallacy. All scams are ineffective. That is what lots of skeptics think. Um, 
And here's one that probably is quite effective. We haven't, uh, we haven't tried it yet, yet, but we have trialed a lot of other uh, treatments. And uh, this is a publication. Don't try to read it. Um, at, at one stage, it, it got on my nerves that uh, people thought I'm, I'm a quack buster, I'm, I'm, I'm just producing negative results for the sake of producing negative results. And I published in the British, Medical, uh, British Journal of General Practice this article of, of all the, the treatments that we have shown to be effective by the standards of evidence-based medicine. Uh, this is a long time ago. Uh, very recently, I published this book where I, I uh, evaluated 150 different modalities and would you believe some of them do more good than harm? Here is a, a list of, of, of some of the treatments that, according to my evaluation, are effective uh, and do, as I said, more good than harm. So not all alternative treatments are ineffective. Some scams might work, as that is expressed very, very cautiously. They might work because the evidence is, is never as strong as, as we would like it to be, but they might work. Appeal to nature, my next fallacy. The argument is that scam is natural and hence it is harmless. Everything that is natural must be harmless. Well, look at this. This is all natural, isn't it? And, and it's, it's far from harmless. And here's a book to win. Uh, I'm not asking the name of, of this guy, but I'm, I'm asking what has he done to him? This is one person. What has he done to him, sir? Yeah. Okay, one book is gone, uh, but there were two, two people, so two, two, two books uh, for that one because the, the last one didn't, didn't get a winner. These are all direct adverse effects of uh, alternative treatments. This is cupping. Um, this is to, to remind us what hap happens or what can happen with uh, spinal manipulation chiropractic. We have an artery here called the vertebral artery. And if you uh, do certain manipulations, that artery just bursts, basically. And when it bursts, you have a stroke. Uh, and when you have a stroke, you can die. There, there are about 500 documented cases, but these are the tip of the iceberg only because we have no reporting system. Uh, this, uh, anyone wants to guess, is a new mosaic due to an uh, acupuncture needle going in, into, into the lung. That, that happens so quickly, you won't believe it. Under my watch, uh, when I was a, a clinician in Vienna, head of department, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, my, my co-workers, uh, uh, produced a hemothorax in a, in a patient with an acupuncture needle. There are acupuncture points here, which in, in a slim person are th about that far away from the lung. And acupuncturists often do acupuncture both sides in, in parallel. So if you, if you deflate two lungs at the same time, you better be very close to a hospital. Uh, this is also acupuncture here. Uh, this is also acupuncture. And this, this is uh, colloidal silver. So uh, the, what, what I was talking about are direct adverse effects. And, and people rightly say, okay, okay, direct adverse effects do exist, but surely they are much, much more prominent in conventional medicine. And they are right, if you think of cancer treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so the direct adverse effects, in my view, are not the big issue in alternative medicine. The big issue is neglect, meaning that serious conditions remain 
untreated or badly treated. Imagine uh, a cancer patient uh, going to a homeopath and the homeopath says, uh, you don't need all this nasty stuff. Uh, I can treat it homeopathically. And don't tell me this doesn't happen. It happens. Uh, there's a clinic in, in, in Switzerland where patients are, 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 are treated like this and on the internet you, you, you find it uh, a thousand times. So, uh, and, and this is just one example, there are obviously plenty, plenty more. But cancer is, is, is a good condition for, for, for that because uh, it, it is such a dramatic uh, condition and, and we, uh, cancer patients are fighting for their survival. This is a publication, a uh, recent publication from, from America and they have compared cancer patient survival in, in patients not using complementary medicine and patients using complementary medicine and you see the two curves diverge very quickly and after five years, uh, the survival of these patients is reduced by 50%, 50%. And we can discuss why, why this is so, but this is the real risk of alternative medicine. And it applies obviously most dramatically to cancer, but it applies to any other disease as, as well. And this is best studied, really, with, uh, in, in, in terms of vaccination. We conducted uh, a seemingly innocent little uh, trial in 2003, where we contacted by email 104 homeopaths, and we, we pretended to be a mother worried about uh, vaccination uh, MMR vaccination, mumps, uh, measles and rubella vaccination because there, there was this big thing in the press in the UK at the time. Um, uh, 27 withdrew, so we had 77 responses to evaluate and our results showed that just 3% advised to immunize, 40% advised against immunization, uh, overtly against immunization and, and the rest was somewhere in, in, in the middle. Now this is just a little survey that we conducted even though it was dramatic because it almost cost me my job. The homo homeopaths complained and, and it, it created a big, big hoo-ha and uh, I was accused f of doing unethical research, would you believe? Because um, it was unethical, they, they claimed, um, because on, I conducted it on non-volunteering human uh, subjects. Um, anyway, uh, a long story. The, the survey is, is just a small survey, but it's important because it has been confirmed over and over and over again. Homeopaths, naturopaths, chiropractors, uh, even doctors practicing so-called integrated medicine uh, often advise their patients against not immun immunizing their kids. And here's the last book to win. Uh, I know you know who that idiot is, but who is that idiot? <laughs> no. Shout it. Andrew Wakefield. Who said it? Someone yeah. Okay, you 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 come you come you come to me. That's Andrew Wakefield. He's he's the man at the heart of the MMR scare. He he claimed that uh, MMR vaccination causes autism. Uh, uh, that research was later discovered to be fraudulent. He was defrogged, etc. etc. Et that's him. And that's, that's uh, one of his quotes. Um, and it's, it's, as I said, it's homeopaths predominantly, but also chiropractors, naturopaths, doctors of anthroposophical medicine, doctors practicing integrative medicine. They all tend to advise against vaccination. 
and and this just ha happens to be studied somewhat systematically, but all the other issues uh, where alternative practitioners meddle in prescribed medicines uh, uh, are virtually unstudied. And this m may well be the, m the most important slide of the evening. If used as an alternative for an effective treatment, even, the, uh, even a harmless therapy can become life-threatening. I think that is really important to take home. But don't go home yet. I have st still uh, two more fallacies, I think. Um, scam is ethical. Um, on, on the map of medical ethics, scam is a white spot. Nobody seemed to have yet looked in, into, into it, except us. We just published a book, uh, even won a prize from the British Medical Association, and, and it covers all these areas in terms of medical ethics. Uh, I recruited a co-author, Kevin Smith, who is an ethicist, so it's authoritative, I hope. I'm not going into all of these, I'm, I'm going to into the most obvious one, informed consent. Uh, informed consent is an imperative in medicine. Whether you treat, whether you research, uh, without informed consent, it is by and large unethical. Hence the argument of the homeopath against me when I, when, when I did the survey. Um, you, you remember what, what the Australians said about homeopathy. So if we take homeopathy, uh, go back to homeopathy in terms of uh, informed consent, I as a homeopath would need to say to my patient, I give you this remedy, it will help you. Take it regularly until you feel better. Trust me, I'm a doctor. That's, that's what I would need to say. That is unethical. Why is it unethical? Because the, the ethical way to approach that is, this is a homeopathic remedy. It contains no active ingredient. The best clinical evidence doesn't show it works, but take it anyway. So, so, so if I behave ethical, the, the patient wouldn't take it. They would run away. And this is why uh, informed consent just simply doesn't happen in, in much of alternative medicine. This uh, is an issue that is uh, not at all well in investigated. Um, telling the truth basically would discourage uh, patients, therefore it would be against the interest of the practitioners who after all have to earn a living and therefore it doesn't happen. As I say, this is, uh, I know of only one single uh, investigation into that, and that was on uh, UK chiropractors. And, we, and I've told you that chiropractic is not harmless by no means. Um, and the investigation showed that that was an investigation by chiropractors, I have to say, that only 23% of them always discuss serious risks. So, as I say, it doesn't happen, informed consent, and therefore much of scam is quite simply unethical. Ha! Now comes the least popular fallacy, uh, namely that skeptics are always right when they think, talk, discuss scam. There's no evidence, they say, some of you say. That's wrong. I've, I've showed you evidence. Uh, uh, homeopathy, where, where this argument is often uh, applied to, uh, I've told you that we have 500 clinical trials of homeopathy. So it's wrong. All of SCAM is ineffective. I've, I've shown you that uh, the my own evaluation, my critical evaluation of, of SCAM produced some scams which do more good than harm. So it's wrong. Uh, all of the research is flimsy, unreliable, etc., etc. I haven't shown you that, but you can believe me, uh, it is uh, 
much of it is, is, is flimsy, but all of it uh, is simply n not true. People who use scam are stupid. Uh, people tend to think that because they tend to think that people who disagree with them are stupid, but it's not true. In fact, tons of data show that, that in all likelihood, the person who uses scam is better educated and therefore arguably less stupid than the average. Conventional medicine is perfect. Well, it isn't. Let me tell you that it isn't. Any, anybody who has had uh, an, a serious illness can, can, can probably confirm that it's not perfect. It's, it's often very good, but uh, not perfect. Uh, all, of sc all scam practitioners are dishonest. Uh, I haven't shown you that uh, in, in much detail, but I can tell you that there are some pretty honest guys uh, in, in, in this uh, realm, and um, the argument is not true. Scam practitioners never help anybody. That, that is probably the most contentious one, uh, because we, th we think of them as quacks. Uh, but we forget that patients who go to, to these practitioners are looking for something and, and they're getting something. What in, in my experience, my belief in my research, they are getting is the empathy, the therapeutic relationship that we in conventional medicine are so bad at conveying. So the argument in my view is wrong. So, time to finish. The end is near. Here are my conclusions. Fallacies are used regularly to promote scam. Fallacies mislead us into making wrong decisions. Fallacies therefore endanger public health. And the best way to present them, to prevent uh, harm, is critical thinking. And that is precisely what my next book, it's not out yet, but it's coming out in a few weeks, uh, is about. It's, it's entitled, Don't Believe What You Think. Uh, and uh, I think that's a valuable message, and I will conclude with that. Invite you again to visit my blog. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, has been uh, has been uh, um, aware of your uh, uh, book uh, book uh, released in uh, in Czech language? No, unfortunately not. Uh, one of my books, uh, the, the most famous one, uh, I co-authored with Simon Singh. It was called in English "Trick or Treatment." Has been translated into more than twenty languages, but Czech isn't amongst them. So I'm very sorry. I would love to have a Czech book. <laughs> we were talking about uh, that about that with the professor that we have to work on getting that done. <laughs> it's on our to-do list. <laughs> Any other questions? Somebody over there. So firstly, thank you for the presentation and also thank you for uh, the systematic review of the systematic reviews. And I would like to ask, is there any such uh, study for acupuncture? Yes. The, 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 most, the most recent one uh, was condu conducted by, by British uh, scientists. I, I, uh, I don't know them personally, but it's a very good one. Uh, it is uh, on pain, because acupuncture um, is, is much used for pain. And it concluded that um, the evidence is not convincing that acupuncture is, a, is an effective treatment for chronic pain. I must correct myself, chronic pain. So that's the, the, the most recent one, um, but there are plenty of others. And in, in uh, any case, it was, uh, in any case, it was not effective. 
uh, I wouldn't swear that uh, that this applies to every single uh, con condition because ac acupuncture is one of those treatments that is used as a cure-all uh, for, for everything from hair loss to impotence from pain to uh, infertility and there's there's so many many studies uh, that I, I wouldn't swear uh, that they're all negative the the data the actual trial data, which goes down two levels, not, uh, not we, are, we are talking of, your question was systematic review of systematic reviews. So one level down would be a systematic review. I'm talking about the trial level, the clinical trial level. There, there are about, I estimate, 5,000 trials of acupuncture. Uh, a good 80% come from China, and I wouldn't touch the Chinese studies with a barge pole. Uh, they, they are so unreliable. We, we and several other people have shown that any s acupuncture study from China, what, whatever condition they are trialing, comes out positive. So a, a negative acupuncture study from China does not exist. That tells you everything. But also we know that f falsification of data. Falsification, I'm not joking, falsification of data is rife in China. So the Chinese studies, I, I, I have big, big problems with them. I've, I've often asked Chinese co-workers, because uh, in, when I was still working in, at Exeter, we had Chinese co-workers and I asked them why, why is that? And, and one polite answer always uniformly was that a, a Chinese researcher would find it offensive, impolite and impossible to do research that contradicts his boss. That's the answer I got. Next question, and then the lady in front of you, and then the gentleman behind it, I'll go to the other side to make it fair. <laughs> okay. uh, in your experience, uh, how many of these scam providers the, the question reminds me of, of a quote from Bert Brecht, who, who, who's, who's, who said, the opposite of good is not evil, but good intentions. Uh, so, so m many scam practitioners have good intentions. So m many of them, in my experience, believe almost religiously that they are doing the right thing. But, but this conviction makes them actually more dangerous, if you see what I mean. Uh, in percentage terms, I, I, I really, really don't know. Um, the, the, and it's not black or white, there's a, there's a gray in the middle, of course, but 50-50, uh, roughly. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question about the Dorn method. About what? Dorn method. D -O -R -N. Dorn, Dorn, yeah, Dorn, Dorn yeah. method, yeah. I, 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 I didn't... I, I didn't know much about it uh, un until recently I, I got the, the question, I looked into it and I wrote a blog post. So if you go on, on my website, you see, you see a blog post and lo it, it pr provoked a lot of comment. Basically, Dorn uh, was, a, was, a, was a German chap, uh, not a doctor, not a physiotherapist, a, a lay person, if I remember correctly, who decided, like Didi Palmer, uh, to in, uh, invent uh, 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 a technique of m manipulating people mostly with back pain. And um, I, uh, some people swear by it, uh, some people say it's rubbish, some people say it's uh, all sorts of uh, techniques stolen from, from other schools of manipulation. Um, the, the fact is that there's not a single trial of it. So uh, if you ask me, does it work? I can, I can only say there is no good evidence that it does work. And what do we do? How do we categorize these many treatments for which there is no evidence at all? We categorize them as unproven. Um, because we have 
so many other treatments to use uh, in, in, in healthcare that, that we focus on the ones where we have positive evidence. So uh, what, what I'm trying to say in, in, in a complicated way is that all these methods for, for which there is no evidence, they need to be classified as don't use them because uh, no evidence means ineffective, it's the default position, the ineffective until proven otherwise. That, that, that's just the medical thinking behind it. Besides all of this, can you do me properly? Yeah, uh, speak up. The, 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 the microphone isn't on, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I hear you, but not through the microphone. Now it's coming through. Well, the, the, I, I showed you a study from, from Bristol where these 71% responded uh, to, to homeopathic treatment. And, and that is a magic figure, this 70%. Uh, it, comes off, it, it comes up with so many observational studies where there's no control group to compare to. And it also corresponds to my own Im impression. Roughly 70% of patients respond. Uh, to to homeopathy in, 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 in that sense, yes, but uh, uh, they, they were not actually responding to homeopathy, they were responding because we, we looked after them, they were hospitalized, uh, they, uh, they, they received a good diet depending on, on what, what they were suffering from, placebo effect and all, all these other mechanisms that I tried to explain to you. So yeah, around seventy percent, and and if if I direct the question at the doctors uh, at the time, there were twelve doctors in that hospital. All all were doing homeopathy. How many believed in 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 homeopathy? Hundred percent. Definitely a hundred percent. Dashita, next question. I changed the batteries, but it still doesn't work much better. I'm sorry. <laughs> We track paranormal tests, and one of this is a test of German skeptics in Gerda Upe, a homeopathic challenge. You know it? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm involved in it. Uh, there, there, uh, there's, uh, at, at present, uh, well, I explained uh, the question first of all. The, the, there's a, a group called uh, uh, Informationsnetzwerk Homeopathy, Information Network Which Homeopathy. Which I say, uh, Norbert Aust will be here next month to speak about that. Yeah, he's, he's, he's great, so you, you ought to come. Uh, 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 and, and he started this in initiative and he, he thought, we ought to give homeopaths the option to tell, uh, or if, if we send them uh, 10 glasses of homeopathic remedies, they ought to be easily able to, by whatever method they choose, to tell which are the placebos. Half of them are placebos and, and, and half of them are real. And they can decide which, uh, which uh, name uh, w w whether it's uh, homeopathic onion or homeopathic Berlin wall or homeopathic duck liver or whatever. So, so, so they at liberty. It has to be a, a high dilution, 
so that they cannot put it in, 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 into a system, chemical system, uh, so, and, and they need to uh, test it on themselves, their, their uh, goldfish or their grandmother, uh, to find out which is which. And uh, if, they, if they can successfully do that, they win, I think, 50,000 euros. So a nice sum. And you would think that any homeopath would jump at this occasion and that they would be inundated with people uh, trying, trying uh, this challenge. Until very recently, there was nobody. Now, there's one person uh, and, and the tests are, as far as I know, presently running. So it gets very complicated because uh, the, the, it, it has to be rigorous and there has to be a notary and, and all this. Uh, it's being set up and shortly we will know whether this guy can do what he thinks he can do. It's finished? Or no, no. In, in, uh, it is presently running, the test. So the microphone doesn't have a function of a microphone but of a talking stick. So who has the next question? Over there. So I'll be talking sick. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, My question, my question is, uh, like, um, you, know, you are a homeopath, so it means that you had some, you had to have some kind of excuse for why the things are not testable, or like because in the past when I believed something that was belief, I had a, like always a reason. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. So, like for example, with the, with the example of the experiment, as you, you said, what would be the excuse that you would use why you cannot test it this way? Well, well one, one excuse I have is actually the, one of the fallacies. Uh, it doesn't fit in the straitjacket of a clinical trial. So, homeopathy is so wonderful, so subtle, so holistic, uh, th that a clinical trial can, cannot capture it because it it is more than just one clinical outcome. It is it is holistic. Uh, that that of course is bullshit. Uh, um, when I was working in in in, a, in the homeopathic hospital, in, in looking back, uh, it's now almost forty years ago. Uh, the the most striking thing in relation to your question is that nobody cared about. Uh, the science. They, they simply knew it was right and this, this is why they did it. Uh, uh, th there was no interest whatsoever in, in science. It was really staggering. Uh, I don't know what else to say to your question. Does it answer your question? Yeah? Some of the things, some of the, some of the things which you show there, like this acupuncture, um, um, massages, and some of these things you consider as that might do more good than harm. So, how is it decided? Where is the edge? If it is um, medicine or if it is yeah, yeah. And I, I understand it's a very good question, and I can't answer it. Uh, it, it is your basically your your tradition, your healthcare system in each country. Uh, so, in w what is considered alternative in in the Czech Republic might not be alternative in in Germany. I have w I have worked in in two countries. I've lived in in several more, but worked in two countries: Germany, no, three countries: Germany, Austria, and England. Uh, Germany and Austria very very similar, obviously, but England quite different in in the sense that. Uh, um, massage therapy uh, is alternative in England, is mainstream in Germany. So it, it is really the tradition of the country and the, the regulation and legislation of the country that decides that. But, but the, 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 there's, no, the, there's never a clear-cut line. 
uh, to, to say this is on the right side and this is on the left side of, of the fence. It's, it's a blurred line, uh, but it's a good question. But still, they are talking about homeopathy as being something uh, outside the mainstream science, and you can't test it, and it works somehow. Well, the easiest uh, when it comes to homeopathy, uh, somebody says it's not testable. You say, "What do you mean it's not testable? I can show you 500 clinical trials." Uh, that that should shut them up. <laughs> Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one of the general ideas in your record treatment is that the truth should be always above all. But uh, if somebody uses, uh, for example, homeopathy or any other, or any other scam, and they are convinced that it works for them and they are absolutely happy with this, would you still take it away from them just for the sake of the truth? Well, I'm 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 not in the business of taking anything away from anybody. That, that, that is a complete misunderstanding of what I'm about. I'm about t telling the truth to people. Uh, as, as doctors, uh, and I still feel I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor even, even though retired, as, as clinicians, we have a responsibility to inform, not to take away. So when I had a patient and he, he said he will do bungee jumping for impotence, I, I, would, I will tell him th that there's no good evidence that uh, bungee jumping cures his impotence and it also doesn't seem very plausible for, from a scientific point of view, but if he insists, I will not stop him. Yeah, of course. Th 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 that's why they're called I illusions. Uh, they're they're uh, religious cause I religious beliefs and um, when I'm confronted with somebody who is of, of, the, of that nature um, I tend not even to engage in controversial discussion because it's, it's, it doesn't bring anything. You only aggravate uh, the, the guy in front of you and your own blood pressure goes up uh, possibly and you lose your cool and eventually you, you insult each other and it's unproductive. Uh, the, the last 30 years or so have taught me no longer to talk to these people. Uh, the, the, the interesting people actually are not, for me, also not the skeptics because we all agree more or less. Uh, by 90% I would say we, we, we are of one opinion. The interesting people are the ones who haven't quite decided. And, and that is the general public. This is the, the most interesting audience for me. And I can't speak to the general public very often, but I write my books for the general public. Next question. Over there. Just a bit to follow up uh, on this question. Because uh, I was speaking uh, on the line, is it a shame that uh, the regular medicine Actually, can help somehow. The people, as you said, that maybe the medicine could use it somehow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That is that is very true. This is this is actually what I mean when I say that uh, whatever the the popularity of alternative medicine means, it also means a criticism. Uh, of what is happening in conventional medicine. In other words, we, we can learn something from, from these guys. We can learn to, to, first of all, have time again. We work in a system where the time is so sh far too short. Uh, se secondly, we stare at our computers when we're uh, supposed to, to look at patients. Uh, 
thirdly, we don't touch them a a anymore. I, I, I haven't been touched by my GP in, in, in Britain since the last 20 years. No, not even a handshake. There's no touch anymore. Touch is Im important. Uh, if you if you think how how much touch is involved in m most of of these alternative <laughs> treatments, um, but this pales into insignificance compared to empathy and and compassion, uh, and that also we we don't have. I'm, I often say that good medicine consists of two blocks. One is is the good science. Uh, it is essential. The other one is what we used to call the the art of medicine, uh, and and that is 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 being forgotten far too often. The alternative practitioners have no science, but are excellent at the art of of medicine, and and uh, in in conventional medicine we can learn or relearn uh, a little bit about the art of medicine. I find myself defending <laughs> alternative medicine here. <laughs> and there's another question over there, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so you started as a homeopath or homeopathist yourself, and then at some point of your career you changed your opinion and went to the other side. What was the turning point for you? What made you change? Uh, I, I hear this question often and, and people s seem to think that there was a Saulus Paulus type of conversion that I was struck by lightning and thought, ah, oh, it's, it's rubbish after all. Uh, <laughs> it, it didn't happen like this. Um, first of all, I was never totally convinced. I, I, I worked in this hospital, I, I saw very many surprising and weird things, which kept me thinking for, for a decade longer. Uh, but it, 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 all it served was to formulate questions in, in my mind. And then when the occasion came to answer these questions and to become a full-time researcher in, in this field, I became a full-time researcher. Meanwhile, I had spent about 10 years in basic research and ha had actually learned how to think critically. So my, my whole perspective has, had changed. I, I didn't, I didn't uh, think any longer, as long as it helps a patient, everything is fine which is the, the prevailing Ger German attitude, uh, in, or was the prevailing attitude in that ho hospital. Anything goes as long as it helps the, the patient. Uh, as a scientist, you, s you see this a little bit different. And as a scientist, when I started in Exeter, I left all my emotional baggage as far as I could, nobody is totally free of it, uh, behind and tried to be as good a scientist as possible, which means I'm, I tried to falsify hypotheses. I did everything to show that whatever we were testing, and, and it was not just it wasn't just homeopathy. And I did everything to to, uh, to show that it is wrong. It doesn't work. And the way you do that in a clinical trial, you, you compared to placebo, you randomize to exclude bias. Uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in, in the end, if you fail to show it's wrong, then it pr it probably is right. This is how science works, and and this is how I understood it, and this is how I applied it. <coughs> One more question. Last question. Yes. I would like to ask you about your opinion on herbalism, and if according to scientific researches, uh, herbal treatment actually works. Yeah, um, you may have noticed that on, on, on the slide where I, I have listed the treatments that actually do work, her, herbal medicine was on the, the, the first one. Uh, there are lots of herbal treatments which do work, which is not surprising. Uh, herbal medicine actually contains something as opposed to homeopathic remedies. They, they, they contain active molecules, traditionally herbs were the most potent poisons, if you remember, hemlock and all this. Uh, so, so we know that they are pharmacologically active. They can do both harm and, and good. And some are actually quite well proven, documented. The, the one that is best proven is St. John's wort. Uh, 
uh, for mild to moderate depression. There are about 40 clinical trials, that, uh, s some of them very good quality, that demonstrate without any doubt that it works at least as good as conventional antidepressants and it has less side effects if you don't combine it with, because, uh, with other medicine because it interacts quite powerfully with other prescribed medicine. That is just one example. And the fact that um, herbal treatments do work is also not surprising for a pharmacologist because a pharmacologist knows that lots uh, of our modern drugs are derived originally from herbs. Uh, cancer drugs, Taxol from the yew tree, um, Vinblastine, vin Vincristine from uh, the periwinkle, uh, aspirin from the willow bark, etc., etc. Recreational drugs? Recreational drugs, yes, yes. We, don't we know them? Yes, no, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for coming. If you'd like to come and have a beer with us, we have a reservation in the restaurant Valka. It's here on the corner uh, of the trams. Otherwise, uh, thank you for coming to the first uh, episode of our lecture uh, series. Uh, come collect your book Please. if you want one. And I hope to see you next month for Norbert Aus. Like we were speaking, he's the uh, main uh, pusher and brain behind the information about homeopathy, which is the largest information network about homeopathy that currently exists. Uh, so please come, and if you want to hear some more talks in Czech, I would, can I just uh, do a quick survey? How many people here only speak English? No, it's, okay. So, if, so good. Uh, if you want to come and hear some more talks in Czech, please check our website. Check out our website. Like I said at the beginning, we have 60 talks per year, so I'm sure you will find a topic that interests you. For example, last week we had a big talk about BDSM. So I'm sure that will, that's a popular enough topic for everyone. So thank you very much, and please thank the professor one more time. Thanks very much. That was fun.